Hi, my name is Abby Perry and I'm an extension educator in the southeast area of the state. Um, I'm based in Carbon County and I thought that a pertinent topic to talk to you guys about today would be um, preventing deer damage on garden or landscape settings. It's something that I deal with quite a bit in Carbon County and something that my constituents tend to ask me a lot of questions about. So I'm just going to go right here to my PowerPoint so we can get going. Um, like I said, talking to you guys about deer damage um, prevention in the landscape setting. Before I really get too much into it, I want to talk about some publications that we have on the Barnyards and Backyards website. So um, under the landscaping tab, there's an additional tab called Reducing Wildlife Damage. Those are different Barnyards and Backyards articles that we have put out um, on this topic. Barnyards and Backyards is a quarterly magazine, if you guys aren't too familiar with it. There's usually nine articles, um, nine to ten articles in it, all kinds of different topics, usually something for everyone. And then a year after those um, magazines, or those articles are published, then they end up available for everyone online. So that's where I'm pulling uh, this screenshot from. And um, I think it's that reducing deer damage and wildlife um, article. There's this page at the end of it called suggested plants. So this is not a um, kind of all-inclusive list, but sort of a tried and true Wyoming deer resistant list. Of course, um, what deer like to eat or what they're willing to eat is sometimes um, regionally specific, but this is a nice base starting point. Additionally, in this list of resources, there's um, some other articles. There's one from um, Colorado, Colorado State University called Preventing Deer Damage. That's nice to um, check out. Another one from Rutgers, and this one from Rutgers breaks down the plants and um, their deer resistance in different levels. So it has like that they're rarely it, eaten or that they're frequently eaten and then kind of in between. And so that's a nice um, publication to start out or to um, get you going and kind of know what kind of plants you might want in your yard. So I think first of all it's good to talk about what is deer damage. So what do I mean when I say those words? And I've kind of broke it down into three categories. So deer in the fall, especially during um, rutting time or they're trying to scrape velvet off of antlers. They tend to do a lot of rubbing on trees. Um, a little bit of rubbing, rubbing maybe is not totally detrimental to your tree, but what happens more often than not is that there's a lot of rubbing. It girdles the tree, which means that it, it's sort of all the, all the way around that band of the tree or in a band all the way around the tree, and it makes it so that the tree can't transport um, water and nutrients from the roots up to the top of the tree. Um, Sometimes if this happens kind of midway on the tree, you might get some sprouts out from the base because that bottom part of the tree is still healthy and alive, but it just can't transport anything. Um, yeah, what you choose to do with the tree at that point is kind of up to you. If it's get rid of the tree and replant or let some of those sucklings go, they're not always the most um, sturdy or strong little saplings that come up. The other thing that happens, um, or another thing that happens is what I call snacking, although snacking sounds more cheer cheerful than what's really going on. And that's when the plant or the deer comes in and just eats your plants. Sometimes it's just that they are curious and take a bite or two, or sometimes they completely decimate what's there. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to talk about or another kind of damage is when they pull plants out. Um, usually out of your container gardens. So deer, again, are very curious animals. And so they might come in, especially like young fawns, try something out. And what ends up happening is that they rip that plant out of your pot. And I was talking to um, clientele here in my county. And um, this particular lady had ceramic pots up um, kind of on a on a ledge next to a front step and the deer had come over and they'd been pulling out different plants that they were curious about and they actually knocked these big ceramic pots 
off of this little ledge that they had, fell on the ground and broke. So what that plant damage is can be um, different. And I don't know if we always think about the pulling out or the breaking aspect of things. So um, I admit when I, this earlier this year, I was doing my gardening and I was feeling very sort of distressed and like, oh, it is me against these deer. But I started driving around my community and looking around and seeing what other people were doing to um, kind of live with the deer. And I started noticing a lot of different techniques that people had come up with. And so a lot of this presentation is pictures that I found again while I was driving around my community um, and what people are doing. And I would absolutely uh, recommend or encourage you to do this in your community. For one, I found it very like, yes, I can do this. Look at all of these great ideas. But also, um, you know, just to get some ideas and what's working in some regions maybe won't work in others. So definitely get out, go for a drive, go for a walk, see what people are doing. In this image, it's mostly um, netting techniques. So netting with PVC, netting um, with stakes to hold up the netting. There's netting around some hanging baskets that, and the hanging baskets are hanging on some shepherd hooks. Um, there's even a little garden in this hell strip that section of land between the uh, sidewalk and the street. There's a little garden and some T posts. This, this fencing might be four or five feet tall um, with netting around it to keep the deer out of that, that space. Um, here's another fence techniques. So the very top skinny picture has um, a chain link and then a fence behind that chain link and the netting that connects the two fences. You need to keep things from either jumping into that space or reaching over the top and munching. Um, the other one that I find particularly interesting is that middle skinny picture and it's a fence that runs along a hedge. And so um, a lot of times I think specifically with the lilacs is what I see in my area is deer come in and these plants that are supposed to be bushes, they come in and eat and kind of turn them into trees. And so a fence like this along a hedge keeps it a hedge instead of a holy hedge. Um, maybe something else to note here is um, around this brick house there's fencing and I just want to point out that the deer do not tend to be afraid of um, spaces simply because they're close to a house. They'll, they're very curious and kind of will get up and get up close and so you'll find a lot of fencing um, or pre damage prevention techniques that are close to the house as well. Um, this one I think two different interesting things are happening. So on this top image, um, there is the fence with the decorations. And so it doesn't have to just be a fence to keep deer out, but it might end up being um, an attraction in your yard. And then this bottom picture, um, I find it's, it's interesting because there's the tree with the vegetation in the foreground that has the fencing around it. And then in the background along the house, there's a tree and vegetation with fencing around it to keep deer out. But then next to the house and next to the stairs, there's some deer resistant plants. And so there's no fencing around those. And that might have been trial and error that this particular person found that the deer eat this, but they don't eat this. And so they fenced accordingly. It might be that they don't really care about these plants. And so they just didn't fence them out and turns out that the deer don't eat them. Um, maybe they drove around like I did and saw what other people had and what didn't require fencing. Um, these pictures are yet again, something different or a different tactic to preventing damage on your vegetation. Um, and these are what I call tree fences. So this top left-hand image is actually from my own yard. We um, got tired of having to replace our fencing every year, either from the UV uh, rays and our sunlight at high elevation breaking down the plastic or the wind ripping the plastic. We also have a lot of drifting at our um, house. And so that was kind of the snow and just harsh winter conditions were breaking down our fencing that we had around our trees. Um, and I also found it to be too short. So deer would come over and reach over the top of the fencing and top off the trees. And so then we'd move the fencing up and then the fawns would come in um, under the fencing and crawl in and get in with the deer. 
And so the, this fence is actually four foot by four foot and there's a gate on it that I can open so I can still mow around my trees. Um, the posts are put in concrete, so we plan on having them there for um, relatively longer time period. I'm hoping that in 10 years, these trees will be nice and tall and we can maybe take the fencing down. Might lose a few of the bottom limbs to deer, but hopefully have a robust enough tree that the rest of the tree does well. Um, one of the other images here has the like cattle gates um, around the tree, which I think is an interesting approach, probably very sturdy. Then there's the pallets and then more the um, PVC type plastic with netting. And then here's just two more images with that specifically fencing out trees. I think that trees tend to be more expensive. They take longer to grow. So if you've got a tree going while you're on it, really do everything you can to keep it um, alive and well. And so here's just some specific deer, or I mean tree prevention tactics. Um, here we have a short fence problem. So Shorter fences, deer tend to jump over. I think that they can clear up to like six foot fences. And so here are some, um, a chain link fence that then got like a wider, um, a wider scale like grid chicken wire type fencing above it. Um, a dog ear wood fence with some chicken wire above it. And then this little picket fence that has almost like a baleen twined type, um, uh, wire up above the picket fence to hopefully keep deer from jumping into the yard. This one is um, flagging. Uh, so the first one is a fenced out tree like we've seen before and then flagging on it. I think the idea to kind of scare away the deer um, so they don't get close to check it out. The second larger image is actually kind of a combination of what we saw in the previous slide with the short fence problem and then the wire strands up above it to keep the deer from clearing that short fence and then some additional flagging. You can see the flagging on the brown house a little bit better, I think. So this is just sort of my comic relief. As I was driving around, I saw deer eating plants. Uh, the deer, the single deer by itself is actually in my own yard. So I'd been driving around taking these pictures and drove back to my house to get something and lo and behold, there's a deer in my yard. Um, these other deer together eating on the bottom of the tree. I think that this is kind of a common thing that we see some bottom sacrificial limbs going to the tree, probably not hurting it in the long run. It seems to be a nice, healthy, robust, bright green tree. But um, something to maybe just keep in mind that even when we fence out the trunks from being rubbed on, that some of those branches are still within reach of those deer. So those are all sort of that fence out, keep the deer away from the vegetation type approaches to deer prevention. But also um, while I was driving around, there's plenty of landscapes that um, aren't fenced at all and have nice vegetation growing. I really like this cottagey look of this top image of plants all intermixed together, lots of different colors, and yet there's no fencing around it. Um, here's a couple more images, kind of same thing, like I said, plants intermixed. I really like that style, different colors together, and yet there's no fencing to keep the deer out. So um, as I saw these landscapes that didn't have fencing around them, I started compiling the list of what those plants were. This is not an extensive list by any means um, or a complete list. This is just a list of the plants that I saw over and over and over that people were not fencing out. And again, depending on where, where deer are and the regional aspect of it, um, you might find that in your region, the deer do or do not eat these plants. But I think it's a really great idea to just start by going out, going for a drive, going for a walk. What are people not fencing and start compiling a list. So just to kind of give you an idea of what these plants are, um, so that I have a daylily, lamb's ear, popping, penstemon here circled. So there's the um, daylily first, the lamb's ear um, has a nice little fuzzy aspect to it. Um, then there's, that's a, a variety of a poppy with the purple or with the pink. And then I'm sorry, the penstemon you can't see really well, maybe a little bit of it um, under my image, purple penstemon. Um, that's not its name, that's just its color. Um, I also want to point out that like lamb's ear, for instance, has a real tendency to spread um, 
this presentation or these images really isn't taking into account any of the other things that might be challenges or might be benefits from these plants, just simply that the deer tend not to eat them. Um, here we have Russian sage down in the lower image um, on the left hand side, yarrow above it next to that white picket fence. In the top image there's a shasta daisy and then hollyhocks and then in that last image snow on the mountain. I um, want to point out two things about these images. So that hollyhock, I have an asterisk next to it and that's because Hollyhock tends to show up over and over and over again on deer resistant lists. I saw it while I was driving around over and over and over, not fenced out, but the hollyhocks in my yard get munched by deer. I think that they are just in a high traffic area where they where the deer walk by. Lots of little fawns who are investigating tend to snack on them. Um, but I just, again, this isn't a foolproof list. This is just a place to start. And then that lower image with the um, snow on the mountain, this is another image from um, my personal yard and the, there, the snow on the mountain, the deer never touch. But just in the foreground in front of that snow on the mountain are some Asiatic lilies and the deer love them. And I have to do a lot of um, spraying, which we'll talk about here in a minute, to keep the deer off of them. So I just don't want anybody to, to see those Asiatic lilies and think that those are also deer resistant. Um, here we have um, Rutabecchia in the bottom image, um, that nice orange color. Um, you might know it as Black Eyed Susan. Above it is a yucca. Um, us usually out in like the rangelands have a really interesting seed pod on them. And then the echinacea that's circled right under my image. Um, again, echinacea has an asterisk there because I've never had a problem with deer eating echinacea. It's on a lot of those deer resistant lists. Um, I have it in my own yard. My mom has it, all of that good stuff. I gave it to a friend this year and the deer devoured it. And so I was talking to a colleague and she had suggested that sometimes when we buy these plants from um, greenhouses, they've just, they've been babied. They've gotten a lot of water, they've gotten a little, a lot of fertilizer, and so they tend to be more tender, and that makes deer want to snack on them more. Um, and then additionally, like I've mentioned before in this presentation, that deer are very curious. So if you add something new to their, um, kind of to their habitat or what they're used to doing day in and day out, they're going to investigate. And so that was kind of the explanation for why this particular echinacea got devoured, that it was probably nice and tender from being at the greenhouse or was just something new in the deer's path and they decided to snack on it. So um, it might be something that in a first year of establishing some plants, you need to do some temporary fencing, but in the years after, um, you, you won't have to. So you don't have to put that fence back up after um, you know the snow beat it down or after it got broken down by the sun or whatever. Just a little bit of protection that first year. Um, here in this image, we have iris, some salvia, and then some peony up in the top with the black circles. Um, again, peony with an asterisk because as I was driving around, sometimes the peony was fenced out and sometimes it wasn't. Um, peonies also tend to need a little bit of stabilization, so I'm not sure if it was fenced out because it was being stabilized or not. But um, it was about 50% of the time it was fenced and 50% of the time it wasn't. These peony are very nice, large, robust, healthy looking peony that don't um, I don't see any indication of being, them being snacked on and I'm pretty confident that um, they would be deer resistant as well. So like I mentioned or like, um, about spraying in my own yard, we've talked about fencing out um, the deer, we've talked about planting deer resistant plants, but there's also this third option of um, repellents. Uh, I know that my grandmother has a recipe for homemade repellents and I just want to caution people that commercial um, repellents go through um, a testing, you know, they're, they're researched, and most of the time our homemade repellents are not. And so um, I just think it's a, I, I would caution people to use homemade repellents and go with something that has been tested and proven or go, gone through some sort of process with, you know, the components that are made up of it or that it's made up of. Um, 
I just did a quick Amazon search, did deer repellents. These three repellents were the first ones that came up. I took a screenshot. I'm not suggesting that any of these are better than the other or that these three products are better than any other product on the market. It's just the first thing that came up in that search. Um, this little expert is from the back of one of them and it just talks about how it's still safe. This particular one was still safe to spray um, around your fruits and vegetables, um, edible things that you might be consuming. And then it also talks about preventing damage from um, other ungulates besides deer. Um, oh, and with these products, sometimes uh, a company will have multiple scents and so deer tend to get used to having some of these repellents and so by being able to alternate scents um, might make them more successful or maybe even alternating between product types. Um, I've lived, I where I've lived I've gone through six growing seasons here and I found that the repellents were very effective for the first three or four years and now they've become less effective and I don't know if it's just um, deer population increasing or that they're getting used to that scent or what it is, but that's just sort of been my personal experience. Um, and then of course there's always the do nothing option. I want to uh, put out there to people that just because a deer are eating on things doesn't mean that you have to do anything about it. Um, you can always just let it go, but I think that the Fencing out um, the repellents or finding some deer resistant plants are the most common. I'm working on putting together um, a demonstration education bed here in my county to kind of look at some of these things and do some a little bit of experimenting um, further with deer resistant plants. So I hope to be able to share that with constituents in the in the future. And again, here's just my contact information. I would love to hear from people or if you want to talk more about um, preventing deer damage, it is something that I'm kind of passionate about. So definitely reach out to me via email or give me a call. Thanks.